Welcome to 2024 and the reading of the Sabbath School lesson for the first quarter. Welcome to lesson number six, titled, I Will Arise, ready for teaching on February 10. It's from the Sabbath School lesson series, Psalms, authored by Dr. Dragoslava Sandrak and read by Dr. Percy Harold. Sabbath afternoon, February 3. Before we start, let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for the blessings that are coming from reading and studying these Psalms. And we thank you that so long ago they were written down, having been memorized, having been transcribed and translated and available to us in just so many languages. And as we study this week, as we open your word, we pray that your Holy Spirit will be here to guide each one of us wherever we are living, wherever we are studying in this sin sick world and today i'd like to pray for carmen bigby in canada with her family and thelma ray and her family as well and gobal and in soweto in south africa and no longer mafosa in honey Jew in south africa as well and angela ferguson with health problems too lord all of us need your care and your attention on a daily basis. And we know as we read these Psalms, our faith is strengthened as we see that you are the God who not only created us, but also provided salvation, but also provides help during our daily living. Bless us now as we open your word, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Our memory text this week is Psalm 12, verse 5. For the oppression of the poor, for the sighing of the needy, now I will arise, says the Lord. I will set him in the safety for which he yearns. Let's read that again. Psalms 12, verse 5. For the oppression of the poor, for the sighing of the needy, now I will arise, says the Lord. I will set him in in the safety for which he yearns. Our age is not the only age in which evil, injustice and depression rage. The psalmists lived in such a time as well. And so, whatever else they are, the psalms are also God's protests against the violence and depression in the world, in our world, and that of the psalmists as well. Yes, the Lord is long-suffering and holds his wrath in his great forbearance, not wanting anyone to perish, but to repent and change their ways, as you read in Second Peter 3, verses 9 to 15. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But... The day of the Lord will come as a thief in a night, in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. Therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness, looking for and hasting the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be dissolved, being on fire, and the elements will melt with fervent heat? Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Therefore, beloved, looking forward to these things, be diligent, to be found by him in peace, without spot and blameless, and consider that the long-suffering of our Lord is salvation, as also our beloved brother Paul, according to the wisdom given to him, has written to you. And though God's proper time for his intervention does not always coincide with human expectations, the day of God's judgment is coming. As you read in Psalm 96, 13, Before the Lord, for he is coming, for he is coming to judge the earth. He shall judge the world with righteousness and the peoples with his truth. And Psalm 98, verse 9, for he is coming to judge the earth with righteousness he will judge the world and the peoples with equity we just need to trust in him and in his promises until that day comes 
Only the Creator, whose throne is founded on righteousness and justice, can provide, with His sovereign judgment, stability and prosperity to the world. As you read in Psalm 89.14, Righteousness and justice are the foundation of your throne. Mercy and truth go before your face. And Psalm 97, verse 2, Clouds and darkness surround Him. Righteousness and justice are the foundation of His throne. The twofold aspect of divine judgment includes deliverance of the oppressed and destruction of the wicked. As we read in Psalm 7, verses 6 to 17, Arise, O Lord, in your anger. Lift yourself up because of the rage of my enemies. Rise up for me to the judgment you have commanded. So the congregation of the people shall surround you. For their sakes, therefore, return on high. The Lord shall judge the peoples. Judge me, O Lord, according to my righteousness and according to my integrity within me. Oh, let the wickedness of the wicked come to an end, but establish the just, for the righteous God tests the hearts and minds. My defence is of God, who saves the upright in heart. God is a just judge, and God is angry with the wicked every day. If he does not turn back, he will sharpen his sword. He bends his bow and makes it ready. He also prepares for himself instruments of death. He makes his arrows into fiery shafts. Behold, the wicked brings forth iniquity. Yes, he conceives trouble and brings forth falsehood. He made a pit and dug it out, and has fallen into the ditch which he made. His trouble shall return upon his own head, and his violent dealing shall come down on his own crown. I will praise the Lord according to his righteousness, and will sing praise to the name of the Lord Most High. This is what we have been promised, and this is what will indeed one day come. But... In God's time, not in ours, a point that the psalmist emphasises. Sunday, February 4, The Majestic Warrior Read Psalm 18, verses 3 to 18, Psalm 76, verses 3 to 9 and 12, and Psalm 144, verses 5 to 7. How is the Lord portrayed in these texts? What do these images convey about God's readiness to deliver His people? Psalm 18, beginning at verse 3, I will call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised, so shall I be saved from my enemies. The pangs of death surrounded me, and the floods of ungodliness made me afraid. The sorrows of Sheol surrounded me, the snares of death confronted me. In my distress I called upon the Lord and cried out to my God. He heard my voice from his temple, and my cry came before him, even to his ears. Then the earth shook and trembled. The foundations of the hills also quaked and were shaken, because he was angry. Smoke went up from his nostrils and devouring fire from his mouth. Coals were kindled by it. He bowed the heavens also and came down with darkness under his feet, and he rode upon a cherub and flew. He flew upon the wings of the wind. He made darkness his secret place. His canopy around him was dark waters and thick clouds of the skies. From the brightness before him, his thick clouds passed with hailstones and coals of fire. The Lord thundered from heaven, and the Most High uttered his voice, hailstones and coals of fire. He sent out his arrows and scattered the foe, lightnings in abundance, and he vanquished them. Then the channels of the sea were seen, the foundations of the world were uncovered. At your rebuke, O Lord, at the blast of the breath of your nostrils, he sent them above, he took me, he drew me out of many waters, he delivered me from my strong enemy, from those who hated me, for they were too strong for me. They comforted me in the day of my calamity, but the Lord was my support. And then 
Psalm 76, verses 3 to 9. Then he broke the arrows of the bow, the shield and the sword of battle, Selah. You are more glorious and excellent than the mountains of prey. The stout-hearted were plundered. They have shrunk into their sleep. And none of the mighty men have found the use of their hands. At your rebuke, O God of Jacob, both the chariot and horse were cast into a dead sleep. You yourself are to be feared, and who may stand in your presence when once you are angry? You caused judgment to be heard from heaven. The earth feared and was still when God arose to judgment to deliver all the oppressed of the earth. Selah. And then verse 12. He shall cut off the spirit of princes. He is awesome to the kings of the earth. And then Psalm 144, verses 5 to 7. Bow down your heavens, O Lord, and come down. Touch the mountains, and they shall smoke. Flash forth lightning, and scatter them. Shoot out your arrows, and destroy them. Stretch out your hand from above. Rescue me, and deliver me out of great waters, from the hand of foreigners. These hymns praise the Lord for his awesome power over the evil forces that threaten his people. They portray God in his majesty as warrior and judge. The image of God as warrior is frequent in the Psalms and highlights the severity and urgency of God's response to his people's cries and suffering. In Psalm 18, verses 13 to 15, we read, The Lord thundered from heaven, and the Most High uttered his voice, hailstones and coals of fire. He sent out his arrows and scattered the foe, and lightnings in abundance, and he vanquished them. Then the channels of the sea were seen. The foundations of the world were uncovered at your rebuke, O Lord, at the blast of the breath of your nostrils. The sheer determination and magnitude of God's action should disperse any doubt about God's great care and compassion for the sufferers or about his ability to defeat evil. We just need to wait for him to do it. In the end, even when God's people, such as David, were involved in war, deliverance did not come from human means. In his many battles against the enemies of God's people, King David praised God as the only one who achieved all the victories. It would have been easy for David to take credit for what happened, for his many successes and triumphs, but that was not his frame of mind. He knew where the source of his power came from. Although David states that the Lord trains his hands for war in Psalm 18.34, nowhere in the Psalms does he rely on his battle skills. Instead, the Lord fights for David and delivers him, as you read in Psalm 18, verses 47 to 48. It is God who avenges me and subdues the people under me. He delivers me from my enemies. You also lift me up above those who rise against me. You have delivered me from the violent man. In the Psalms, King David, who was known as a successful warrior, assumes his role as a skilled musician and praises the Lord as the only deliverer and sustainer of his people, as we read in Psalm 144, 10 to 15. The one who gives salvation to kings, who delivers David his servant from the deadly sword, rescue me and deliver me from the hand of foreigners, whose mouth speaks lying words, and whose right hand hand is a right hand of falsehood, that our sons may be as plants grown up in their youth, that our daughters may be as pillars sculpted in palace style, that our barns may be full, supplying all kind of produce, that our sheep may bring forth thousands and ten thousands in our fields, that our oxen may be well laden, that there be no breaking in or going out, that there be no outcry in our streets. Happy are the people who are in such a state. Happy are the people whose God is the Lord. Praise and prayer to the Lord are David's sources of strength, which are more powerful than any weapon of war. 
God alone is to be trusted and worshipped. And so to finish the day, whatever gifts and skills and success you have had in life, why must you always remember the source of them all? What dangers do you face if you forget that source? Monday, February 5, Justice for the Oppressed Read Psalm 918, 12, 5, 40, 17, 113, 7, 146, 6 to 10 and 41 verses 1 to 3. What is the message here to us today? First of all, Psalm 9, 18, For the needy shall not always be forgotten. The expectation of the poor shall not perish for ever. And then Psalm 12, verse 5, For the oppression of the poor, for the sighing of the needy, now I will arise, says the Lord, I will set him in the safety for which he yearns. And Psalm 40, verse 17, But I am poor and needy, yet the Lord thinks upon me. You are my help and my deliverer. Do not delay, O my God. And Psalm 113, verse 7, He raises the poor out of the dust and lifts the needy out of the ash heap. And Psalm 146, beginning at verse 6, Who made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that is in them, who keeps truth forever, who executes judgment for the oppressed, who gives food to the hungry, the Lord gives freedom to the prisoners, the Lord opens the eyes of the blind, the Lord raises those who are bowed down, the Lord loves the righteous, the Lord watches over the strangers, he delivers the fatherless and widow, but the way of the wicked he turns upside down. The Lord shall reign forever. Your God, O Zion, to all generations. Praise the Lord. And Psalm 41, verses 1 to 3. Blessed is he who considers the poor. The Lord will deliver him in time of trouble. The Lord will preserve him and keep him alive, and he will be blessed on the earth. You will not deliver him to the will of his enemies. The Lord will strengthen him on his bed of illness. You will sustain him on his sick bed. God exhibits special care and concern for justice regarding the various vulnerable groups of people, including the poor, needy, oppressed, fatherless, widows, widowers, and strangers. The Psalms, like the law and the prophets, are clear on that point, as you read in Exodus 22, verses 21 to 27. You shall neither mistreat a stranger nor oppress him, for you were strangers in the land of Egypt. You shall not afflict any widow or fatherless child. If you afflict them in any way, and they cry at all to me, I will surely hear their cry, and my wrath will become hot, and I will kill you with the sword. Your wives shall be widows, and your children fatherless. If you lend money to any of my people who are poor among you, you shall not be like a money lender to him. You shall not charge him interest. If you ever take your neighbor's garment as a pledge, you shall return it to him before the sun goes down. For that is his only covering. It is his garment for his skin. What will he sleep in? And it will be that when he cries to me, I will hear, for I am gracious. And Isaiah 3 verses 13 to 15, the Lord stands up to plead and stands to judge the people. The Lord will enter into judgment with the elders of his people and his princes. For you have eaten up the vineyard. The plunder of the poor is in your houses. What do you mean by crushing my people and grinding the faces of the poor, says the Lord God of hosts? Many Psalms use the expression poor and needy, and avoid representing the oppressed in exclusively national and religious terms. This is done in order to highlight God's universal care for all humanity. The expression poor and needy is not limited to material poverty, but also signifies vulnerability and helplessness. The expression appeals to God's compassion and it conveys the idea that the sufferer is alone and has no other help but God. 
The depiction poor and needy also pertains to one's sincerity, truthfulness and love for God in confessing one's total dependence on God and renouncing any trace of self-reliance and self-assertion. Meanwhile, caring for the deprived, as you read in Psalm 41, 1-3, demonstrates the people's faithfulness to God. Evil done against the vulnerable were particularly heinous sins in biblical culture, as you read in Deuteronomy 15, verses 7 to 11. If there is among you a poor man of your brethren within any of the gates in your land which the Lord your God is giving you, you shall not harden your heart nor shut your hand from your poor brother, but you shall open your hand wide to him and willingly lend him sufficient for his need, whatever he needs. Beware lest there be a wicked thought in your heart saying, The seventh year, the year of release is at hand, and your eye be evil against your poor brother, and you give him nothing, and he cry out to the Lord against you, and it becomes sin among you. You shall surely give to him, and your heart should not be grieved when you give to him, because for this thing the Lord your God will bless you in all your works, and in all to which you put your hand. For the poor will never cease from the land. Therefore I command you, saying, You shall open your hand wide to your brother, to your poor and your needy, in your land." The Psalms inspire faithful people to raise their voices against every oppression. The Psalms also underline the futility of grounding one's confidence on perishable human means as the ultimate source of wisdom and security. God's people must resist the temptation to put ultimate faith for salvation in human leaders and institutions, especially when they differ from God's ways. In his grace, our Lord identified himself with the poor by becoming poor himself, that through his poverty many might become rich, as we read in 2 Corinthians 8 verse 9. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that you through his poverty might become rich." Christ's riches include deliverance from every oppression brought by sin, and he promises us eternal life in God's kingdom. And we read that in Revelation 21 verse 4, And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. Jesus Christ fulfills the psalm's promises as the divine judge who will judge every mistreatment of the deprived as well as neglect of duty toward them, as we read in Matthew 25, verses 31 to 46, when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the holy angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate them one from another as a shepherd divides his sheep from the goats. And he will set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on the left. Then the king will say to those on his right hand, Come, you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you drink? When did we see you a stranger and take you in, or naked and clothe you? And when did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? And the king will answer and say to them, Assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch as you did it to one of the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. Then he will also say to those on the left hand, Depart from me, you cursed, into the everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and you did not take me in. Naked, and you did not clothe me. Sick and in prison, and you did not visit me. Then they also will answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry, or thirsty, 
or a stranger, or naked, or sick, or in prison, and did not minister to you? Then he will answer them, saying, Assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. And so to finish today, how much do we think of the poor and needy among us, and how much do we do for them? Tuesday, February 6. How long will you judge unjustly? The Lord has endowed Israel's leaders with authority to maintain justice in Israel. As we read in Psalm 72, verses 1 to 7, Give the king your judgments, O God, and your righteousness to the king's son. He will judge your people with righteousness and your poor with justice. The mountains will bring peace to the people and the little hills by righteousness. He will bring justice to the poor of the people. He will save the children of the needy and will break in pieces the oppressor. They shall fear you as long as the sun and moon endure throughout all generations. He shall come down like rain upon the grass before mowing, like showers that water the earth. In his days the righteous shall flourish and abundance of peace until the moon is no more. And verses 12 to 14. For he will deliver the needy when he cries, the poor also and him who has no helper. He will spare the poor and needy. He will save the souls of the needy. He will redeem their life from oppression and violence and precious shall be their blood in his sight. Israel's kings were to exercise their authority in accordance with God's will. The leader's central concern should be ensured peace and justice in the land and caring for the socially disadvantaged. Only then shall the land and the entire people prosper. The king's throne is strengthened by faithfulness to God, not by human power. Read Psalm 82. What happens when the leaders pervert justice and oppress the people they are asked to protect? Psalm 82, beginning at verse 1. God stands in the congregation of the mighty. He judges among the gods. How long will you judge unjustly and show partiality to the wicked? Selah. Defend the poor and fatherless, do justice to the afflicted and needy, deliver the poor and needy, free them from the hand of the wicked. They do not know, nor do they understand. They walk about in darkness. All the foundations of the earth are unstable. I said, you are gods, and all of you are children of the Most High, but you shall die like men and fall like one of the princes." Arise, O God, judge the earth, for you shall inherit all nations. In Psalm 82, God declares his judgments upon Israel's corrupt judges. The gods, in verses 1 and 6, are clearly neither pagan gods nor angels because they were never tasked with delivering justice to God's people and so could not be judged for not fulfilling it. The charges listed in verses 2 to 4 echo the laws of the Torah, identifying the gods as Israel's leaders. In Deuteronomy 1, verses 16 to 18, Then I commanded your judges at that time, saying, Hear the cases between your brethren, and judge righteously between a man and his brother, or the stranger who is with him. You shall not show partiality in judgment. You shall hear the small as well as the great. You shall not be afraid in any man's presence, for the judgment is God's. The case that is too hard for you, bring to me, and I will hear it. And I commanded you at that time all things which you should do. And Deuteronomy 16 verses 18 to 20. 
You shall appoint judges and officers in all your gates, which the Lord your God gives you according to your tribes, and they shall judge the people with just judgment. You shall not pervert justice, you shall not show partiality, nor take a bribe, for a bribe blinds the eyes of the wise and twists the words of the righteous. You shall follow what is altogether just, that you may live and inherit the land which the Lord your God is giving you. And John 10 verses 33 to 35. The Jews answered him, saying, For a good work we do not stone you, but for blasphemy, and because you, being a man, make yourself God. Jesus answered them, Is it not written in your law? I said, You are gods. If he called them gods, to whom the word of God came, and the scripture cannot be broken. God questions the sons of men, whether they judge justly, and their punishment is announced because they have been found unrighteous. The leaders totter in darkness without knowledge, we read in verse 5, because they have abandoned God's law, the light, as we read in Psalm 119, verses 100 and 5. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. The scripture unswervingly upholds the view that the Lord is the only God. God shares his governance of the world with appointed human leaders as his representatives. As you read in Romans 13, 1, let every soul be subject to the governing authorities. For there is no authority except from God, and the authorities that exist are appointed by God. How often, however, have these human representatives, both in history and even now, perverted the responsibility that they have been given? Psalm 82 mockingly exposes the apostasy of some leaders who believed themselves to be gods above other people. Although God gave the authority and the privilege to the Israelite leaders to be called the children of the Most High and to represent Him, God renounces the wicked leaders. God reminds them that they are mortal and subject to the same moral laws as all people. No one is above the law, as you read in Psalm 82, verses 6 to 8. I said, you are gods, and all of you are children of the Most High, but you shall die like men and fall like one of the princes. Arise, O God, judge the earth, for you shall inherit all nations. God will judge the entire world. God's people, too, shall give an account to God. Both the leaders and the people should emulate the example of the divine judge and place their ultimate hope in him. And so to finish today, what kind of authority do you hold over others? How justly and fairly are you exercising that authority? Take heed. Wednesday, February 7, pour out your indignation. Read Psalm 58, verses 6 to 8, 69, verses 22 to 28, 83, verses 9 to 17, 94, verses 1 and 2, and 137, verses 7 to 9. What sentiments do these psalms convey? Who is the agent of judgment in these psalms? Psalm 58, beginning at verse 6. Break their teeth in their mouth, O God. Break out the fangs of the young lions, O Lord. Let them flow away as waters which run continually when he bends his bow. Let his arrows be as if cut in pieces. Let them be like a snail which melts away as it goes, like a stillborn child of a woman that they may not see the sun. And Psalm 69, beginning at verse 22, Let their table become a snare before them, and their well-being a trap. Let their eyes be darkened, so that they do not see, and make their loins shake continually. Pour out your indignation upon them, and let your wrathful anger take hold of them. Let their dwelling place be desolate, 
Let no one live in their tents, for they persecute the ones you have struck. And talk of the grief of those you have wounded. Add iniquity to their iniquity, and let them not come into your righteousness. Let them be blotted out of the book of the living, and not be written with the righteous. And Psalm 83, beginning at verse 9. Deal with them as with Midian, as with Sisera, as with Jabin at the brook Kishon, who perished at Endor, who became as refuse on the earth. Make their nobles like Oreb and like Zeb, Yes, all their princes like Zeba and Zalmana, who said, Let us take for ourselves the pastures of God for a possession. O oh my God, make them like a whirling dust, like the chaff before the wind. As the fire burns the woods, and as the flame sets the mountains on fire, so pursue them with your tempest, and frighten them with your storm. Fill their faces with shame, that they may seek your name, O Lord. Let them be confounded and dismayed for ever. Yes, let them be put to shame and perish. And Psalm 94, verses 1 and 2. O Lord God, to whom vengeance belongs. O God, to whom vengeance belongs, shine forth. Rise up, O judge of the earth. Render punishment to the proud. And Psalm 137, beginning at verse 7. Remember, O Lord, against the sons of Edom, the day of Jerusalem, who said, Raise it, raise it to its very foundation. O daughter of Babylon, who are to be destroyed, happy the one who repays you as you have saved us. Happy the one who takes and dashes your little ones against the rock. Some Psalms beseech God to take vengeance on individuals and nations who intend to harm or who have already harmed the psalmists or their people. These psalms can sound perplexing because of their harsh language and apparent discord with the biblical principle of love your enemies, as we read in Matthew 5.44. But I say to you, love your enemies, bless those who curse you, do good to those who hate you, and pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. Yet, the psalmist's indignation in the face of oppression is a good one. It means that the psalmists took right and wrong more seriously than did many people. He cares even greatly about the evil that is done in the world, not just to himself, but to others as well. However, nowhere does the psalmist suggest himself to be the agent of vengeance. Instead, he leaves retribution solely in God's hands. The Psalms evoke the divine covenant curses of Deuteronomy 27 and implore God to act as he has promised. Deuteronomy 27 verses 9 to 16. Then Moses and the priests, the Levites, spoke to all Israel saying, Take heed and listen, O Israel. This day you have become the people of the Lord your God. Therefore you shall obey the voice of the Lord your God and observe his commandments and his statutes which I command you today. And Moses commanded the people on the same day, saying, These shall stand on Mount Gerizim to bless the people when you have crossed over the Jordan. Simeon, Levi, Judah, Issachar, Joseph, and Benjamin, and these shall stand on Mount Ebal to curse Reuben, Gad, Asher, Zebulun, Dan, and Naphtali. And the Levites shall speak with a loud voice and say to all the men of Israel, Cursed is the one who makes a carved or mould image, an abomination to the Lord, the work of the hands of the craftsmen, and sets it up in secret. And all the people shall answer and say, Amen. Cursed is the one who treats his father or his mother with contempt, and all the people shall say, Amen. The Psalms are prophetic proclamations about God's impending judgment. They are not solely the psalmist prayers. Psalm 137 reflects the announcements of divine judgment on Babylon as seen in the prophets. The devastation that the Babylonians brought to other nations would turn back on them. 
The Psalms convey divine warnings that evil will not go unpunished forever. God's retribution is measured with justice and grace. God's children are called to pray for those who mistreat them and even to hope for their conversion, as you read in Psalm 83, 18, that they may know that you, whose name alone is the Lord, are the most high over all the earth. And Jeremiah 29, verse 7, And seek the peace of the city where I have caused you to be carried away captive and pray to the Lord for it. For in its peace you will have peace. However, while seeking to fit these psalms with the biblical norms of love for enemies, we must be careful not to minimise the agonising experience expressed in them. God acknowledges the suffering of his children and reassures them that, in Psalm 116 verse 15, precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. Divine judgment obliges God's people to raise their voices against all evil and seek the coming of God's kingdom in its fullness. The Psalms also give voice to those who suffer, letting them know that God is aware of their suffering and that one day justice will come. And so to finish the day, who doesn't at times have thoughts or fantasies about vengeance on those who have done them or their loved ones terrible wrong? How might these Psalms help you put such feelings in proper perspective? Thursday, February 8, The Lord's Judgment and the Sanctuary Read Psalm 96, verses 6 to 10, Psalm 99, verses 1 to 4, Psalm 132, verses 7 to 9 and 13 to 18. Where does God's judgment take place and what are the implications of the answer for us? How does the sanctuary help us understand how God will deal with with evil. First of all, Psalm 96, beginning at verse 6. Honour and majesty are before him. Strength and beauty are in his sanctuary. Give to the Lord, O families of the peoples. Give to the Lord glory and strength. Give to the Lord the glory due his name. Bring an offering and come into his courts. O worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Tremble before him all the earth. Say among the nations, the Lord reigns. The world also is firmly established. It shall not be moved. He shall judge the peoples righteously. And Psalm 99, beginning at verse 1, The Lord reigns. Let the peoples tremble. He dwells between the cherubim. Let the earth be moved. The Lord is great in Zion, and he is high above all the peoples. Let them praise your great and awesome name. He is holy. The king's strength also loves justice. You have established equity. You have executed justice and righteousness in Jacob. And Psalm 132, beginning at verse 7, Let us go into his tabernacle. Let us worship at his footstool. Arise, O Lord, to your resting place, you and the ark of your strength. Let your priests be clothed with righteousness, and let your saints shout for joy. And then again in verse 13 onwards, For the Lord has chosen Zion. He has desired it for his dwelling place. This is my resting place forever. Here I will dwell, for I have desired it. I will abundantly bless her provision. I will satisfy her poor with bread. I will also clothe her priests with salvation. And her saints shall shout aloud for joy. There I will make the horn of David grow. I will prepare a lamp for my anointed. His enemies I will clothe with shame. But upon himself his crown shall flourish." Where does God's judgments take place? The Lord's judgment is closely related to the sanctuary. The sanctuary was the environment where the psalmist's understanding of the problem of evil was transformed, as you read in Psalm 73, 
verses 17 to 20. Until I went into the sanctuary of God, then I understood their end. Surely you set them in slippery places, you cast them down to destruction. Oh, how they are brought to desolation as in a moment. They are utterly consumed with terrors. As a dream when one awakes, so, Lord, when you awake, you shall despise their image. The sanctuary was designated as the place of divine judgment, as indicated by the judgment of Urim in Numbers 27, 21, and by the breastplate of judgment of the high priest in Exodus 28, 15, and verses 28 to 30. Let's look at those in Exodus 28. Beginning at verse 15, you shall make the breastplate of judgment artistically woven according to the workmanship of the ephod. You shall make it of gold, blue, purple and scarlet thread and fine woven linen. You shall make it. And then from verses 28 to 30. They shall bind the breastplate by means of its rings to the rings of the ephod, using a blue cord so that it is above the intricately woven band of the ephod and so that the breastplate does not come loose from the ephod. So Aaron shall bear the names of the sons of Israel on the breastplate of judgment over his heart when he goes into the holy place as a memorial before the Lord continually. And you shall put in the breastplate of judgment the Urim and the Thummim, and they shall be over Aaron's heart when he goes in before the Lord. So Aaron shall bear the judgment of the children of Israel over his heart before the Lord continually. And Numbers twenty seven twenty one. He shall stand before Eleazar the priest, who shall inquire before the Lord for him by the judgment of the Urim. At his word they shall go out, and at his word they shall come in, he and all the children of Israel with him, all the congregation. Accordingly, many psalms depict God on his throne in the sanctuary, ready to judge the world for its sin and evil. At the sanctuary, the plan of salvation was revealed. In paganism, sin was understood primarily as a physical stain to be eliminated by magic rites. In contrast, the Bible presents sin as a violation of God's moral law. God's holiness means that he loves justice and righteousness. Likewise, God's people should pursue justice and righteousness and should worship God in his holiness. To do that, they must keep God's law, which is an expression of his holiness. Thus, the sanctuary is the place of forgiveness of sin and restoration of righteousness, as indicated by the mercy seat of God's throne and the sacrifices of righteousness, as we read in Deuteronomy 33 and verse 19, they shall call the peoples to the mountain, there they shall offer sacrifices of righteousness, for they shall partake of the abundance of the seas and of treasures hidden in the sand. And Psalm 4 verse 5, offer the sacrifices of righteousness and put your trust in the Lord. Yet the God who forgives takes vengeance upon the wicked deeds of unrepentant people, as you read in Psalm 99 verse 8. You answered them, O Lord our God, you were to them God who forgives though you took vengeance on their needs. The practical implications of the sanctuary being the place of divine judgment are seen in the constant awareness of God's holiness and demands for righteous living according to God's covenantal requirements. The Lord's judgment from Zion results in the well-being of the righteous and the defeat of the wicked, as you read in Psalm 132, verses 13 to 18. For the Lord has chosen Zion. He has desired it for his dwelling place. This is my resting place forever. Here I will dwell, for I have desired it. I will abundantly bless her provision. I will satisfy her poor with bread. I will also clothe her priests with salvation, and her saints shall shout aloud for joy.' 
There I will make the horn of David grow. I will prepare a lamp for my anointed. His enemies I will clothe with shame, but upon himself his crown shall flourish. The sanctuary fostered the jubilant expectations of the Lord's coming as the judge, especially during the Day of Atonement. Likewise, the Psalms strengthens the certainty of the impending arrival of the divine judge, as you read in Psalm 96 verse 13. For he is coming to judge the earth, he shall judge the world with righteousness, and the peoples with his truth. And Psalm 98 verse 9. For he is coming to judge the earth, with righteousness he will judge the world, and the peoples with equity. Namely, Jesus Christ in the heavenly sanctuary. As you read in Revelation 11, 15 to 19, Then the seventh angel sounded, and there were loud voices in heaven, saying, The kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign for ever and ever. And the twenty-four elders who sat before God on their thrones fell on their faces and worshipped God, saying, We give you thanks, O Lord God Almighty, the one who is and who was and who is to come, because you have taken your great power and reigned. The nations were angry and your wrath has come, and the time of the dead that they should be judged, and that you should reward your servants, the prophets and the saints, and those who fear your name, small and great, and should destroy those who destroy the earth. Then the temple of God was opened in heaven, and the ark of his covenant was seen in his temple, and there were lightnings, noises, thunderings, an earthquake, and great hail. And so to finish the day, read Romans 8, verse 34. Who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died, and furthermore is also risen, who is even at the right hand of God who also makes intercession for us. How does this verse show us that what Christ is doing in the heavenly sanctuary is good news for his people? Friday, February 9. Further thought. We are recommended to have a look at the chapter Beatitudes in the book Thoughts from the Mount of Blessing, pages 6 to 13 and 29 to 35. And if you have a copy, I'd suggest that you have a look at that. But let's continue with the reading of what's here in the lesson. The Psalms are protests against human indifference to injustice. They are a refusal to accept evil. They are motivated not by a desire for revenge, but by a zeal to glorify God's name. Hence it is fitting for the righteous to rejoice when they shall see God's vengeance on evil, because in this way God's name and his justice are restored in the world, as we read in Psalm 58 verses 10 and 11. The righteous shall rejoice when he sees the vengeance. He shall wash his feet in the blood of the wicked, so that men will say, Surely there is a reward for the righteous. Surely he is God who judges in the earth. The Psalms oblige people to raise their voices against evil and to seek the coming of God's kingdom in its fullness. In the Psalms, we are given assurance of divine comfort and deliverance. The Lord will arise. And then we have a quote from Thoughts from the Mount of Blessings, and this comes from page 33. When men shall revile you and persecute you, said Jesus, rejoice and be exceeding glad. And he pointed his hearers to the prophets who had spoken in the name of the Lord, as it says in James 5.10, an example of suffering, affliction, and of patience. Abel, the very first Christian of Adam's children, died a martyr. Enoch walked with God and the world knew him not. Noah was mocked as a fanatic and an alarmist. Others had trial of cruel mockings and scourgings, yea, moreover the bonds and imprisonment. Others were tortured, not accepting deliverance, that they might obtain a better resurrection. Hebrews eleven thirty six and 
verse 35. End of quote. And that brings us to our four discussion questions for this week. One, because the painful realisation of the evil in the world can cause one to wonder whether the Lord actually reigns, how can we grow an unshakable faith that will stand strong even under temptation? That is... What must we focus on in order to maintain our faith in Christ's love and goodness and power? What should the cross say to us about God and his character? And two, why is it important not to rely on human means, leaders, institutions and social movements as the ultimate wisdom and solution for justice in the world, but rely solely on God's word and judgment? And three, what are the practical implications of the truth that the sanctuary is the place of divine judgment? And four, how can we understand the harsh language of some psalms? How does that language help us relate to the humanity of those who wrote them? And now it's time for Inside Story with Sibylla Harold. Thank you, Sibylla. Invited to Church Part 2 by Andrew McChesney 17-year-old Sekule wanted to know truth as a high school student in Sarajevo, capital of Bosnia and Herzegovina. So he started to visit various houses of worship. But he didn't find satisfactory answers to his questions about why a god of love would burn someone in hell for eternity. So Sekule resolved to find the truth on his own by reading the New Testament. When he returned to his home village in Montenegro that summer, he read one Bible book a day. On the first day he read the 28 chapters of Matthew. The next day he read Mark. Then he read Luke, John, Acts and Romans. He read only one book a day, even when he came to such smaller epistles as Titus and Philemon. Some answers to his questions about God emerged in his reading of the New Testament, but he longed for more information. He visited several more houses of worship, but he didn't visit a Seventh-day Adventist church. He had heard that Adventists celebrated sweet Sabbaths every week, a time when they engaged in sexual relations with each other. He thought, they're crazy, they cannot have the truth. Failing to find answers in the many houses of worship that he visited, He decided that God probably did not exist. He stopped reading the Bible. Then a high school teacher saw Sekule's Bible. She was an Adventist, and she saw the Bible as faculty members conducted random searches of dormitory rooms to see whether boys were hiding alcohol or drugs. What have you learnt? Many things. She quizzed him about Daniel, and Sekule, who had a good memory, provided clear answers. You actually understand, she explained. You're the first person who I've met who understands. You must come to the Seventh-day Adventist church. Sekule didn't dare refuse. She was his teacher. He feared that she would lower his grade if he didn't go. OK, I'll go, he said. But he lied. He had no plans to go to church. Sekule's... Sekuli is an affluent entrepreneur and faithful seven-day Adventist in Montenegro. Read more of his story next week. And thank you for your Sabbath school mission offerings that help spread the good news of Jesus' soon coming in Montenegro and around the world.